Trial Lawyers University, where the Titans come to train. Produced and powered by Law Pods. Brian Panish, guess what episode this is of TLU Podcast or TL Trial Lawyers Universe Podcast? Actually, it's number two. So we got Brian Panish here, who was just, you know, I've been in California. I was there for about 10 years, and I only heard about Brian Panish. Never got to meet him. Met you occasionally. You don't remember that, though, because, you know, it's okay. I'm easy to forget when I was younger. But, Brian, you and I got to know each other a bit during the pandemic. And that was a lot of fun. And you were kind to come on and break down cases with Rex on the the Lemming case. But let me ask you, the pandemic for all of us was a, a life-altering somewhat event for all of humanity. So what did you decide to do to make it a positive experience for yourself and for PSBR? So during the pandemic, because we were doing these Zoom depositions, people were on the locations, multiple lawyers were involved in preparing. There's millions of documents. We developed use of the app of the app Slack where we had a team and people could text me questions while I was questioning. I could text them back, get further clarification, exhibits, and we carried that over into using that during jury selection. When we were picking jurors during the pandemic and we were unable to be talking to the other people with us. And I would get Slack notices on my watch and then I would just ask the questions. So we developed some new things. I think the use of Zoom, you know, probably we had been doing it before, but to this extent, no. Zoom deposition saved a lot of time. In this case, I would go downtown. I would drive an hour plus to get there, park, $30, $40. Then I'd have to go in the big building, go through the security, go up in this big defense firm's office, be in a little room. They wouldn't give us anything. We'd have to stay there all day. And then drive home in the traffic. So we eliminated multiple hours of that. So other than the unfortunate death and illnesses that were caused by the pandemic and loss of business for most businesses, I think it was pretty productive for us, the pandemic. I think so too. I, the pandemic was clearly the greatest blessing of my life. But for the pandemic, you and I wouldn't be friends. And so many people I got to know around the country and got to learn from and got them to mentor me and mentor a large group of plaintiff's lawyers in the meantime, wouldn't have happened but for the pandemic. So, so you got to make the good, the best out of a bad situation. And that's what lawyers, particularly plaintiff lawyers, need to do. You're facing a lot of bad facts, a lot of bad situations, and you've got to turn those to your advantage. You got to. You got to. I was thinking about calling this podcast Get Back in the Game. But then I remember, then somebody told me, oh, Panish, this was called Get in the Game. So I didn't want to plagiarize, plagiarize it. So what's the, what's the state of the Get in the Game podcast? Because people really like that. But it's the Get not in the Game I hasn't been doing too many podcasts lately. The main podcast for me has been doing so many other things that I just haven't had the time and commitment to do it. But maybe we should get that going to compete with this uh, podcast. This is going to get to number one one day soon. and. And that way, if you're back podcasting, then I have somebody directly compete against it because we all need we all need a competitor. Well, you know, we could set up a challenge, Ambrose, and we can go and say, give a certain period of time, and you do a certain number of shows, and let's see who's higher ranked. We'll have to work on it because I'm gonna I'm gonna really be working on my podcasting skills. That's what I can say. Let me see. How did you you know? Because you, you kind of epitomize for a lot of people what a trial the trial lawyer. But you're not just a trial lawyer, but you also built a, a very big firm. And, and in fact, in the last couple of years, it's almost doubled in size, hasn't it? It's been a little more than a couple of years. But yeah, the firm has you know grown since it started in April of uh, 2005. No, I know that, but it seemed so, like before the pandemic, you only had about 20 lawyers. And I think you got about 40. No, no, we had more. But I mean, there's definitely been more lawyers. You know, we have a lot more work. We got a lot of trials. And so you need more personnel. And we had younger lawyers that are coming in. We're training and they're learning the ropes now. Yeah, we got a lot of great lawyers over there that I'm looking forward to seeing because you have the 
the PSBR trial college coming up in Utah. So tell us a little bit about that because that should be a lot of fun. Well, it's going to be a plant floyer only, you know, seminar networking opportunity, not to the extent of the TLU, but most of these people that are coming, we know them, we do business with them. And we want to share some ideas and different types of cases, how we handle the cases, how we get prepared for trial, some history of what we've done and how you can make changes in the law. And other than just getting a big verdict or big settlement, we're going to talk about networking. We're going to talk, we're going to have the Duke basketball coach, Kerr Larson, who's awesome, come in there and talk about do hard better. And we're going to have me come up and answer questions. And we're going to have a lot of fun activities. It's going to be a great opportunity to learn, to network, and to have a good time for a few days up in Utah. I'm really looking forward to it because I know so many people in your firm personally and really, really like the group of lawyers you have there. I mean, besides being great lawyers, really a wonderful group of human beings. So that's something to be, I know you're proud of them, but you know, you don't say it very often, but it must be very proud of your group there. I'm very proud of them all, including one of your protégés. We had a party for last night, Dave Rudorfer, who got nearly $13 million verdict out in Van Nuys, a tough jurisdiction. Yeah, I told you when I, when Rudorfer did his first webinar, did a couple of them, like, I told you, this guy is a talent. This guy is a rock star. It just, you know, obviously, and every time he tries a case, it's proven again that the, he is a rock star. and He's going to be one of your... You know, you have so many great people over there, great lawyers, but I think he's really going to be rising quickly. That's just my opinion. He's doing a great job, or many others, but he's got results. And trial lawyers, <laughs> it's all about what are your results? All about the results. It's all about the results. Well, you were just at our Huntington Beach conference for a little bit last week teaching about summation. And so you, you getting ready for final arguments. So can you give us some of the highlights of what you shared last week in Huntington Beach with our group that was there? Well, I talked about how organization is critical, how there are certain things you want to accomplish, but the most important thing is the jurors want to know what does the plaintiff need, which questions have to be answered for the plaintiff to win, and talked about money and arguing money and all the different ways you do it. But I talked about developing modules. For example, I start off, thanking everyone involved. Then I get into an empowerment discussion about the history of the jury system, what they're been one of 12 chosen out of all the hundreds of people that came and all the opportunities and really trying to empower the jury. And that changes from case to case. Talking about use of jury instructions in argument, how to effectively use those. And talked about arguing money damages and anticipating defense arguments and defense contentions and how to knock those down in the final argument before the defense gets up. And then saving some of your key information for your rebuttal argument that you really want to nail them with and they don't have a chance to respond. How do you go about deciding which information you want to to save? Because it's always a challenge. It's like, what do I want to do in my first one? Well, there's certain things I always save, you know, because I know they're going to bring them up. So I want to be able to come back and get them. And the rebuttal argument is not supposed to go on forever and ever. You want to get in, make your key points, and get out. I mean, many times I've probably been guilty of myself. Lawyers think they're giving another final argument, and it's not. And if you, if, But if you do it effectively, short and sweet, you can really uh, drive home some big points. When, you haven't been in trial since the pandemic, right? So the last trial was the most Well, I was, no, I was in... Uh, well, if you don't, I, I guess trialers, they don't count arbitrations, but I've been in three fine arbitration ones that lasted over six months. And I was in the last trial was in the uh, Rojas case. So that was on CBN. That was about a year and three months, maybe. All right. Well, we and I've been in a couple other cases that started and then they settled. And that's the problem here. We got a big, big backlog. I was set for six cases this year already that have that have been continued. None of those have settled. And I have numerous other cases, including uh, four that are set to come to trial this summer in Las Vegas. So I'm hoping some of those will go in to Las trial. Vegas. In Las Vegas. I've been spending a lot of time there. 
got a lot of cases there, and it's a, it's a great place to practice. Is your courtroom done in Las Vegas yet? Almost. Almost. You know what they say, the supply chain. That's a trick question. So everything else is done. Our office is one block from the courthouse. We've put in a new courtroom. We're going to do training, mock trials, a lot of great stuff. Be ready to do as many trials as we can. Well, if you're nice to me, I'll come over there and do some trainings there too. The, my skills boot camp. A couple of your guys did it. Wait till you see their skills in trial. You're going to be blown away. Well, one of you, one of your guys uh, will be going to trial here soon with Dave Rudolph, so we'll see how he does. Hunter or he Alec? Hunter. Oh, he's great. Those people are they, pretty sharp kids. That's all I could say. For uh, right out the gate, pretty sharp kids. So, you know, you've obviously reached a fair level of success in this life as a trial lawyer, and you know, so the the real question I always. You know, people always think it's like, because I hear people say, wow, if I hit that big verdict for 30 million bucks, I'd be done. Or when I got this much money, I'd be done. Well, that clearly is not the case for you because, you, you know, you, you're not even, you don't seem anywhere near being done. So what is it that really, you know, gets you motivated, gets you fired up every day to get back in there? Number one, the clients. And you're their only chance. You're the champion of their cause. And I really get involved with the clients and their stories and what they've been through. And then at the end of the case, and you see what a great difference you've made in their lives and how appreciative they usually are for everything you've done. So that's the number one thing. Obviously, I want to have a firm be still up there as a top plan of firm, doing as many trials as possible, developing young talent and making the firm so it can go on if I'm not there. And it'll continue to have a culture of great trial lawyers, hard work, and putting the client first at all times. Uh, those are good philosophies. So let me ask you this. What do you think you're, I mean, we're all really best at something, you know, so and I consider that to be our superpower. I know what my superpower is. What would you say your superpower is, Brian Panish? Well, I would say either... Things that I've been blessed with, for example, height. I think in a courtroom, being tall doesn't mean if you're shorter, you're not going to be a great trial lawyer. I worked with Bruce Broilette, who is not the tallest guy. He's a great <laughs> trial lawyer. But it helps, I think. You know, that gives you a presence already. You're a big person. I think a deep voice I was blessed with, which I probably got that from my father, but I didn't smoke all the cigarettes and drink all the alcohol that he did to get that, probably. And I think um, a great memory, which I think was genetic. And I think the hard uh, work ethic that I learned through athletics, discipline, and accountability have been crucial for me as what I would, if you want to call it a superpower, I would just say things that have really helped me be successful in what I'm doing. Things that help you to be successful. So I know that, you know, we talk occasionally. And when I, I remember asking you, I said, what are you best at? What skill are you best at in the courtroom? Do you remember what your answer was? Cross-examination. No, it was all of them. I said, okay, if we got to pick one of them, what would it be? And that's when you said cross-examination. Well, I do believe that you have to be good in everything as a trialer. I mean, you can't say, oh, I hate direct exam. Many people hate direct exam. Direct exam is so important. And if you do it right, it's so effective. So I used to like poo-poo that and think, oh, cross-examination, that's what all, where all trials are won. It's a search for the truth. you got to tear them down. That's true, but there's a lot more to it. And you have to be good in all the skills. It's kind of like a, a baseball player. They say a five-tool player, you got to be able to run, you got to be able to hit, you got to be able to field, you got to be able to catch, you got to be able to throw. And as a trial lawyer, you got to be good at all these skills. Some of you may be better than others, but you want the ones that you're not as good, you want to get better on, and you need to work on it. Jury selection, some people aren't so good at that. They need to work on opening statement. Everyone thinks they're great in cross-examination, but I took a multiple-day course in cross-examination, and I learned a lot of things that I didn't know, and I think it helped me crystallize my thinking and my tactics, and I've changed a lot. And I've done that by when I'm doing depositions now, I have the transcript usually in Zoom and I'm looking at my questions and my, what I say, you know, like people like to say, uh-huh, 
uh huh, yes, and but isn't it true? And all those things that you need to lose. And I've learned that and I'm still learning and it's hard and you fall back into these bad habits, but you see the transcript, you kind of train yourself when you get in trial, hopefully you'll be much better at it. So if somebody wanted, wanted to be better at cross-examination in the world, according to Brian Panish, give us, what would you say the top three things you need to focus on are? I'll tell you the number one thing which when I was a young lawyer, my father was a lawyer, he claimed he tried 500 jury trials. He tried a lot of cases. And he was a great cross-examiner because I experienced it every day at the dinner table, every night. And when I was a young lawyer and I was winning some cases, and I was you know, pretty full of myself at that time. And I was defending cases, it wasn't that hard. And I said, you know, I really could cross-examine, cross-examine, and I'm really good at that. And he says, let me tell you something. When you've taken a thousand depositions, then you might know something about cross-examination. And the point that that is, is you got to keep doing it and doing it. And you're not going to be in trial as much. And the depositions is where you're going to practice this tactics and techniques that you've used. So the most important thing is to keep practicing it. Uh, number two is to read the transcripts and see, do you have good transitions? Are you looping all the different tactics that you use using their words instantaneously simultaneously um spontaneously are you, looping are are you doing it in a conversational way and i think one way thing that i've learned working with dodd is about kind of a cross-examination dialogue without the question and answer you're just making statements like you are driving down the road. And they'll say, is that a question? And you say, you were driving down the road, weren't you? And they'll say, yes. And when you were driving down the road, you saw the pedestrian. Is that a question? When you were driving down the road, you saw the pedestrian, didn't you? Yes. And when you were driving down the road and you saw the pedestrian, you turned right and hit the pedestrian, right? Or you don't say, right, that's bad. And you, so you work, you build those questions in, in a dialogue form. And eventually, if you train the witness right, they're going to just start answering when they're, you know, when you're just making statements. And it's kind of a dialogue and a conversation in a story like manner. So I think that's important. But practice is the number one most important thing. You know, don't ask questions you don't know the answer to. Sometimes I do that. I violate that rule. I mean, we've broken down tapes of trials, crosses that I've done. And sometimes you got to take chances. And sometimes you don't know the answer. But if you know that whatever the answer is, it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Sometimes you got to take chances, though. I mean, you really do. And then other times you got to know when this witness is, you're not going to get them. So you got to go on the periphery. You got to hit the collateral impeachment. You got to hit the bias big time. And don't go head to head in the opinions and get out. So we, Cases that, you know, stand out in your mind. Of course, the Anderson case was against GM. I know that's, you always, you always say that was your favorite case. Is that correct? Uh, I would say it's one of them. I wouldn't say it's the favorite, although obviously it was a huge amount, $4.9 billion and a lot of notoriety and all that. But, you know, the heck, that was uh, 24 years ago. And you were so, a very young man then. Yeah, I was very young. I'll show you the pictures. But... Uh, there's a lot more cases from that. Some of my favorite cases, trials. Yeah, and trials. I had a lot of cases that were great that never went to trial. Yeah, but those aren't seven. as interesting to talk right. about. No, some of them are. But so let's have verdicts. So the Lampy versus Continental Tire was right in the middle of the tread separation epidemic. And that was, I represented Joe Cortez, professional boxing referee, and his daughter who was paralyzed in a tread separation. That was, I think, a $55 million verdict, 2001. And then when, three when, years when $55 after, million dollars was a lot of money. It was real money. Well, and then we had but trial. What, of, well, what, what did you love about that trial? What was it about that case, that trial, oh those people God, that you... Because we're fighting this big, massive tire company, and they had all these top experts, top in-house people, top lawyers from around the country. And it was a hard fought case. What I know about, what I remember best about that case is this. Well, multiple, one, 
the judge had 16 jurors instead of 12, and then she was going to draw out four that would be alternates. The four that got drawn, drawn out were all good for me. So that was not good. Oh, so you didn't know so who I, your alternates were going to be like we normally correct. do. Correct. Right. Is that, the judge's so then, is that the judge's prerogative? or? Not, it isn't now, but it was then because now the statute is clear. You, you can't really do that. But she kind of forced the parties to do it. And in a sense, it ended up helping me. But I lost those four good jurors. So I was, you know, a little concerned. There was a $25 million offer. In that case. During the trial. So it started off with maybe a $3 million, $5 million. <laughs> Like once a week, some guy from the defense firm, that guy would come over with a letter for me and it would be a, a new offer. Eventually, I would try to avoid the guy, but finally, they came to an offer of $25 million towards the end of the trial. This is a three-month trial. So then, met, sat with the clients, met with them, and we had a prior settlement with Ford and with Sears, so they had some, some significant money. But they, they wanted to get $37 million. So I tried to negotiate. Now, we're in jury deliberations. It's maybe gone three or four days, maybe four days, maybe five. And we don't really know what's going on. And we get a question. And the question is, well, this is a product defect. So the first question was, was the product defective in manufacture? Was there causation? Was the manufacture, was the design defective? Was there causation? Those are the first four questions. And then you would get to uh, damages and comparative negligence, which is a big claim, by the way. So the jury sends a question that says, what if we can't answer question number three? Now, one way to read that is, they've been going three or four days, they already answered number one, maybe that's not good, they answer number two, no, the case is over. So the defense lawyer, in a nice way, came up to me after the question and said, Wait, what was, what was question number three? Was the product defective in design? First one was manufacturing. And it was primarily manufacturing case. The design case was harder, but we had a theory on it, uh, some alternative design that they were using on much more high-end tires. And so the lawyer came up to me in a nice way and said, hey, Brian, just so there's no confusion, the $25 million is withdrawn. The offer is zero. I said, okay, well, you know, not much I can do about it. And I go outside and sit on the bench for another day and a half, you know, sweating it out. And the next question was, can they have a read back of the economy? So then I started to feel good. Then they started to negotiate. And, but they met, there was a breaking point with the insurance. It was through this alliance in Germany and they wouldn't offer any more money. They wouldn't get to the $30 million the clients want. And when you think about it, it's not really a lot more than twenty five. But <laughs> So it's now Easter week. My family has gone to Palm Springs. I was supposed to be on the vacation, which this happens. But my son was maybe a year and a half, and he stayed here for a week. And then uh, the babysitter brought him to court on Friday, Good Friday. The jury's still deliberating. I had him in the courthouse cafeteria and then the jury the judge is saying well maybe we'll take a partial verdict if they answered every other question we could do that and then all of a sudden at like three o'clock on good friday the jury says they have a verdict so the jurors come out and question number one yes question number two yes question number three no but that's okay we don't care but still there's a huge issue on the comparative negligence they're blaming the, the driver for losing control. We had the tests on it. So they start reading off the numbers because the comparative comes last. And so the first number they give was for the non-past medical, which is not in dispute, future medical, which I think we were trying to get 15 or 16 million. And the jury gave like 7 million. Like, oh my gosh. So then they start reading off the other numbers, and then they get to the one plan of general damage is $48 million. But still, if they found 50% comparative or more, we would be close to getting less than the $25 million. 
And then they answered the comparative question, no. But then there was question nine. And question nine was, did they engage in uh, malice, fraud, or oppression? And I thought for sure, I'm going to get 100 million compensatory damage, and I'm going to get 300 million punitive damage, and I'm going to get all the money, and I'm going to be all going to retire. But I didn't really want to retire, but I'm going to be, <laughs> we're going to get the money. Well, question nine. I told the jury, if you don't answer question nine, this whole thing's going to waste the time. You know, they gladly pay the money. They're only worried about question nine. Jury answers question nine, no. Keep in mind, it's, it's Easter week. Everyone wants to get out of there. They've been there for three and a half months. And so they come out with these two women to go out in the hallway. And they're like smoking cigarettes. And they say, hey, Panish, we know you're pissed off on that number nine, huh? And they're like, I go, yeah, what the hell's going on? They said, hey, I'd just like the 48. <laughs> <Really? laughs> I said, well, that's pretty good, but what about number nine? And eventually the case settled and the client was taken care of, but that, that was a great case. But my, probably I would say my favorite case was a case called Cuthbertson versus the Metropolitan Transit Authority. Mr. Cuthbertson was a 46-year-old African-American who was visually impaired and legally blind. He lived with his mother, who was 78. He would use the massive transit, the buses, the trains, because that's the only way that a person that is visually impaired can, tran can go around transverse Los Angeles County. It's a huge place. I learned in the case that in 1964, when President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, part of it was all these ADA uh, requirements for visually impaired and other people with disabilities. So uh, this case, so Cameron goes, is all on video to the train station, the Blue Line, which is a train that goes through the most economically depressed parts of Los Angeles County, Watts, Willowbrook, Compton, Linwood, uh, Inglewood. And he goes to go on the train. This is a above ground train. They also have underground trains here. And he has his cane. And what a visually impaired person looks to is the light coming up. But as he went, he saw the light, he stepped. Well, the problem was these cars were coupled together, but there was no barrier, nothing that would protect someone from falling in. And keep in mind, this is maybe eight feet below is where the track is. So he falls in, and the train operator, not paying attention, and runs him over, cuts him in half. He dies. We got the videotape, we had all these patents that they'd applied, showing all these other places and the other trains that they had within the same system that had what they called the gap, mind the gap. And they had something to protect us. There's patents back to the late 1800 and trains on this. So we we'll go to trial and the MTA offers $5,000. That's it. We go through the whole trial and the key to the case besides you know, showing they were, they were all lying and some bad evidence, is the plaintiff, the mother, was a beautiful woman, 78 years old. She said, my son, because he was blind, had great hearing. But I have bad hearing. So he was my ears, and I was his eyes. And that was kind of the theme of the case. The jury on the $5,000 offer gave $17 million, 12 to 0, after a long, hard-fought case. So I think that might be my favorite case of all time because of the challenges, because of what it did to make changes for the train system, and for that MTA to have no respect for these people and to say the value of your son's life is $5,000 is not willing to even budge one inch. I think that was that was very satisfying to take care of Miss Cuthbertson and let her be vindicated and learn that her son's death should not have occurred. And you said they made so, changes. So they made changes because from my memory, because we talked about this before and actually wrote about this in a book that you're we're still waiting to be published, was that in the poor parts of town they didn't have these safety protocols, but in the wealthier parts of town they did. 
That's so true. It's like economic. Well, that was the first train put in, so they didn't have. But then they started putting the Pasadena train and these other trains. That was called the blue line. Then they had the gold line, the red line, the purple line. All those had barriers mining the gap and not making such a dangerous situation. Well, so that was probably. I mean, there are so many other ones that I could talk about. Everyone was fun. Uh, when you win, it's always fun. <laughs> when you lose, you know, it's tough. Right. Because, like, what was the last case you lost? That Michael Jackson case? Or Actually, I lost another case after that. But I haven't lost a case. I think it was, like, 1988. Uh, Tonight to 2009. So, what was that like 21, 22 years, something like that? Had a couple hung juries. Vioxx case had a hung jury. Then I lost the Michael Jackson case. What year then was that? Next, uh, that was, I don't know. I to look, you'd have to look that Anyways, up. That, I was just curious. I think it was at least. Mm, um, they all kind of the years. That's all right. It's, it's, it's after 2010. Because I think I just got to California after that sometime. So anyway, then, so I guess it was it was past 2010. So I'm looking it up right now. Oh, the exact details uh, are not that important, Mr. Panish. The dates, okay. just general anyway, are fine. I think it was maybe 20 some years I lost. So then I go in the next case. I'm trying to get wrongful death. A woman steps off a curb, gets hit by a bus, disputed. I didn't have the greatest jury. I didn't like, like the way it was ending up. And I was lucky to get a high low agreement. Lucky. And we lost the case, but the clients got like $4 million. Uh, but. That was a hard case, but then I haven't lost any since then. Thank goodness, because I know losing is not fun. Especially no, it's <laughs> not, but it is reality. If you're going to be trying cases, it's reality. People, you're going to lose cases. No case is unlosable. It just happens. I see it happen many, many times. Usually, the cases you lose are not the greatest cases. But I've seen great cases be lost, too. I would say the cases that I've lost, they were pretty hard cases. And I thought maybe I won in the courtroom, but I didn't win in the verdict. So, But you learn from losses somewhat. People say, oh, I learned some more, so much more from my losses than my wins. I don't necessarily believe that. I think you learn things, you maybe mistakes you might have made. And usually the mistake you made was taking the case in in the beginning. Case selection. Critical for a plaintiff lawyer. Uh, I think that probably is the biggest lesson you learn or the, along the way that the case could have been resolved or something could have happened differently. Sometimes you take the case and they're never going to pay. The Michael Jackson case, they made it clear they're not going to pay one dime. Case is Vioxx case, they're not paying one dime. So I've been in those kind of cases too. There's no pressure. I mean, you win, you win, you lose. You know, they didn't offer anything. What are you going to do? Other than you lost a bunch of money, your client didn't get anything, and you spent a lot of time, and maybe it was a case you shouldn't have taken. But some of those cases I lost, I didn't take them in. So I don't really <laughs> feel fully. Well, the first few that I lost as a plaintiff lawyer, none of those I took in. Why do you think you lost the, the uh, Michael Jackson case? Because I know that's probably your most famous loss. That he's the most famous. You're number one, the jury. The jury was bad. There were people there that just shouldn't have been on the jury. We had a bad draw. This is the best we could do. Number two, I think the court let a lot of evidence in that really had no relevance in a wrongful death case. I think the, the other side was over to just, you know, with 100 lawyers on the case to just overwhelm. And I think it was a hard case, too. Although the hardest part, they said, and the theory was that AEG, Anschutz Entertainment Group, who had, uh, was going to do the concert things with Michael, had pushed him and they to, to get the, all this money they're going to get in rehearsals. And he was doing terrible and he was getting propofol by this doctor every night. 
when he thought he was sleeping, but he really wasn't. He was up for 40 some days before he died in the system failed. Because probify you don't sleep. And I think uh, the main theory was that AEG had hired the doctor and that he was their agent. So the jury found it. They said, we'll never find that the ju- that AEG hired the doctor, but they found that they did hire the doctor. But then the judge ruled there could be no course of scope because it's a doctor, which we didn't agree with, but we lost on that. And then on the negligent uh, hiring, retention, supervision, we didn't really get the instruction on retention. And our position was it was fine in the beginning, but when it started getting really bad and they knew about it because they were having meetings and there's all these emails and they knew that he was doing terrible and they kept pushing him that they should have got rid of the doctor, not allowed it. The doctor was convicted in a criminal court. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew Michael Jackson. So we lost. I, I was worried about it because I hadn't lost for so long. I lost and about a day I was over it. I mean, you know, I, I was disappointed. I spent, you know, months and months. and But I think we did the best we could. We left it all in the, in the courtroom, and I don't know what else we could have done. Well, that's the key thing is, you know, as long as we did our best in the trial, because, you know, we've all, anybody's tried cases lost and knows the, the horrible feeling. I mean, as a criminal defense lawyer, losing a case is just the worst thing in the world for somebody who believes innocent and watching them being carted off to jail and knowing that, you know, likely they're supposed to spend the next 10 or 20 years locked up because you simply were not good enough. Because if they were innocent, they should have been found not guilty. But it doesn't always work that way. No. Or the whole judicial system is not always, you know, predictable. That's the understatement of the century. That's the understatement of the century. You know, you sent me over, and I read it a while ago, your autobiography that we're waiting to get finished. So when can the world expect to, the, the Brian Hanna story to be published? Because it's a great book. I mean, it's like, I'm it's so much out. better than like reading a John Grisham novel because you know all these cases that you talk about and there are real and, you know, puzzles that you had to solve and, the, you know, that's the stories of them. I'm working on it. We're going to get that done. In 2024? I hope so. <laughs> okay. We got to get things more definitively done. So we're really stoked that you're coming to New York City with your new friend, Ben Morelli. And, uh, I, I, you know, I always tell well, people. Well, Ben Morelli and all the other people in the firm, not just Ben. Well, I understand. It's a great firm, great people. I love them all. And I'm looking forward to coming to New York where both my parents were born and raised in New York City. Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn. And, and I have uh, some relatives still living there. So I have several cousins around the New York uh, Fire Department, New York City, my uncle was big and uh, high up in the New York City Fire Department. My grandfather, who came from Ireland, was a New York City police officer. So I'm looking forward. I like New York. It's a great place. I think it'd be hard to live in all the time. And the litigation is way different there than it is out in California. And, and, and so what are you going to be teaching there? I know you, I asked this earlier and yelled at me. So what well, do you, what do you think you're going to teach there? Telling the story of your case. Talk about how do you convey this case. And and it may not be a big case in terms of it's not a person of notoriety. It's just a regular person who's doing the thing, has has their life, and it's been upended by some incident. How do you convey that to people to turn that into money and compensation for your client? So I'll talk about that. And whatever else you think I should talk about after. Thank you. Oh, I, I'm really excited because I'm still working on convincing Mr. Panish here to do a one day, like just one day masterclass on trial for a small group of people. That'd be such a cool experience for those people. Like, okay, telling, doing your, oh, you know what I mean, whatever it is, putting together your opening statement, putting together your cross of an expert, whatever it is to teach one skill to a small group of people and let them actually practice. But we're going to keep working on this with, you know, with Brian, but we, we're getting in there. It's always, I have to plant these seeds. They take a couple of years. Just like the whole, I told you three years ago. We should- I was teach. I taught high school, so I, I I've taught long ago. You taught high school? I did. I was when I was coaching high school football when I graduated from college and before I went to law school. Wow! How long did you teach for? Two years. 
Because I really. One year I was just a substitute. That was something. Being a substitute teacher, <laughs> like a great. Imagine with that in high school. Oh my gosh. I'd sit there and read the newspaper and stop fights. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. I think, though, about teaching and speaking, I really think that that is one of the you know, things that lawyers do you know, in a kind of a volunteer sort of way, but really helps their trial lawyering. Because you know, as a trial lawyer, you're basically a teacher to a group of 12 or however many people are there. And you know, when you're presenting at a conference, you're teaching a particular skill and you have to you know, be mindful of your audience, connect with them constantly trying to read them to make sure they're getting what you're what you're delivering so do you think by teaching a lot speaking a lot that really you know helps with the courtroom stuff well i think you know you're you're in the business of persuasion and communication and by the more you practice those skills communicating and as you would say using hand gestures body position don't you worry i'm gonna help we're gonna work negative, on gestures negative one of these days i'm gonna learn all that uh but yeah, I think it makes a big difference. Uh, Raul Ravaputi in our firm, who's a great trial lawyer partner, has won many eight-figure verdicts, has been teaching at Loyola Law School, I'm going to say, more than 10 years. And I think it's dramatically helped him improve his abilities. And I, I really see it in him. And he's been a lot of practice and teaching that class religiously for years. Trial ad, now he's teaching a board dire class. He is. I'm trying to get him and Sonia to come out and teach a two-day voir dire class in New York City. He teaches the class all semester. Well, then it should be easy to do in New York. He's all primed for it. So I got to do a lot of convincing around here. Well, but jury selection is different in all these different parts of the country, too. Well, that's true, too. But we got to teach general concepts and principles who all stay the same. You know, framing your issues, the, you know, the rapport building. You got to do all that no matter where you're at, right? True? Yes. I think so. All right. Like today and every day, what are you doing? You know, what, what are you working on getting better on today? Today, Friday? Friday. What are you getting better well, at today? Today, I, w- I woke up at like 5.15 and I was reviewing a couple cases. Then I worked out for about an hour and 40 minutes. Then I was reviewing more information. I'm working on a case that has a big issue that I have to deal with. Um, and then later today, I got to go to the dentist. It's and always then, fun. Yeah, then I'm, then I'm going to work, go back to the office and work on, you know, but although it's a holiday weekend, so people will probably be leaving early. I'll, I'll be there in the end, but people will be leaving early to go home and enjoy the weekend, which, you know, that's okay certain times. I would hope so. I would so I'm working on everything. I'm working on getting better all the time, every day, working on getting better in some aspect of my life. That's important. Always got to be getting better. And I'm looking forward to the Get in the Game podcast coming back because I was never a guest on it. I hear all these people. I'm like, how come Pash never asked me to be a guest? Hurtful. I didn't know you then. I know. But we, are, do you think you're going to bring it back? By popular demand, I might have to. I think you should. I thought it was like... Uh, the, all the episodes I listened to, I really enjoyed. And I am working on becoming the best podcast host I can be. So in that regards, everybody, anybody's got feedback from me because I know people like to give me feedback. You can either call me on my cell at 248-808-3130 or that's the best way. Just call me. Send me a text. That way I can, I, I got to get, you know, sometimes people say things that hurt my feelings, but then I got to take it in. I'm like, I, that's just, you know. Because when I, when I started doing the webinars, some people would send me emails. You talk too much. You're obnoxious. You're abrasive. I was like, wow, that hurts. But I worked on my, my hosting skills. And so continually working on these things. Well, Brian, great seeing you as always. I you know, miss me living in LA. So I could run into you more frequently, stop by your office and visit you. But I'll be back to visit sometime soon. Okay, well, my well, when pleasure. When you're in Vegas, look sure you, you, you know, let me know. I'll be I'm there almost tomorrow. done with my remodeling project here. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. My pleasure to be here and good luck. Join us September 20th to 23rd in New York City for TLU Live. We're going to have some of the greatest trial lawyers in the country coming from Brian Panish, Ben Morelli, Judy Livingston, Joe Freed, Zoe Littlepage, Rex Paris, and the list goes on and on. And not only will we have four lecture tracks, but we're going to have seven workshop tracks 
where you can work on and hone a specific skill in a small group taught by a great trial lawyer. The website is TLUNYC.com. Ready to train with the Titans and set records with your verdicts? Register for our live conferences and boot camps at triallawyersuniversity.com. Start getting your reps in before the big event by going to TLUOnDemand.com to gain instant access to live lectures, case analysis, and skills training videos from the trial lawyer champions you love and respect, as well as pleadings, transcripts, PowerPoints, and notes for a roadmap to victory. Join the group that continues to get extraordinary results. Trial Lawyers University. Produced and powered by LawPods.